so I can still remember it like it's yesterday. I'm sitting in a conference room in Bethesda, Maryland, and it's been about three and a half hours since we've had a bathroom break. I'm doodling in my notebook, fighting an urge to go look at my phone and check my social media and my email and my text messages and the score of the Washington Capitals game and the guy won't stop talking. I was in the weekly management meeting at the company I worked at. I was uh, one of the senior management folks. I was actually the head of marketing and, and chief marketing officer there. And while I sat in that conference room doodling away in my notebook, all I could think about would be how happy I would be if I owned a farm. If I was able to quit life in Washington, D.C., and move to the middle of nowhere and start raising animals and growing plants and focusing in on trees and having an orchard and doing this whole permaculture thing that I had started to get into and, and be really interested with. And I was thinking, gosh, life would be so good if I didn't have to do all of this, this conference room life that I'm dealing with right now. I could just be out on the open pasture working on the farm. So as I sit down to record this message for you guys today, that moment that I was having back in Bethesda was almost eight years to the day of when I'm recording this. I hadn't even really found the farm that we would eventually buy. I hadn't had any sort of plan for how I'd earn a living and what my wife would do, or even if my wife was going to be okay with it. But at that point in 2015, I had definitely caught the farming bug, and I really knew that that was what my life's calling was, and I needed to make some major changes in my life in order to do that. Pretty much from the moment that I moved to Washington, D.C. back in 2014, I had gone from a rather happy-go-lucky, career-centered guy to somebody who was miserable and depressed. I was entering into my mid-30s, and I was starting to wonder, is this, like, this all this is? Is there more to life than just what I'm doing right now? And I was starting to look for avenues of escape. One thing I had done that year was I had taken the front yard of our tiny little row house in the Capitol Hill section of Washington, D.C., and ripped up the lawn and put in a couple of garden beds. And I had started growing all sorts of vegetables for my wife and me. And that activity had become one of the few bright points in my life. And it had gotten me down this whole gardening to permaculture to culture pipeline that I see so many people go down today. I started consuming YouTube videos obsessively. I was constantly listening to podcasts on my long commute from Capitol Hill to Bethesda. I was becoming one of those obnoxious foodies who was always asking the waiter at the restaurant, where did this chicken come from? Like I was a character in a Portlandia sketch. This is local? Yes, absolutely. I'm gonna ask you just one more time, and it's local. I was taking three hour drives to go on field trips to farms like Joel Salatin's Polyface down in Swoop, Virginia, Swope, Virginia, wherever it is, I went out on several field trips out there. And it was that point in my life that my wife and I were just starting to have the conversations of saying, well, maybe we do give up city life. Maybe we do move out to a farm in the middle of nowhere. Maybe we do figure out a way to set our life up differently. And I think the reason I was pushing that idea so hard with Allison was because I was feeling so driftless and I was feeling so depressed. And I felt like having a project, having a mission, having something much grander that I was aspiring to was going to be something that was going to make me happy. I genuinely believed that a farm would make me happy. But now, as I sit here to record this message to you guys on a October morning, sitting inside my greenhouse that will soon become a housing for, I don't know, let's see, probably about 80 birds, I can tell you all with great certainty that a farm will not make you happy. Like, 
let me just say that again. A farm will not make you happy. You might think that moving out to the middle of nowhere will help you address your problems. You might think growing your own food and taking control of your family's food security is going to make you happy. You might think raising animals and being a caretaker is going to be the thing that makes you happy. You might think that having a mission and having a purpose and having a calling is going to be the thing that makes you happy. But as somebody who's been through that whole adventure... I'm here today to tell you guys that a farm will not make you happy. But I don't say all of this to be like a major bummer to you and and crush your dreams if you're, you know, thinking about starting a farm or thinking about, you know, trying to find a way to create more food for you and your family and friends. I'm not saying that to be the dream crusher here. I'm saying that to be like the person giving you the reality check. And I also want to, by the end of this episode, give you a perspective on the things that will actually make you happy. Because regardless of where you are in life and regardless of what you see as your life's purpose, there is definitely some key things that you can focus in on to make yourself have a happier life. And it's not going to be having a farm. Like, I'm just going to tell you right now. And when I moved up to the farm back in 2018... I moved to the farm to start the farm, but I also took a new job at a local company here in Vermont as a way to basically pay the bills. Because even though I've done relatively well financially over the years from working, in my mid-30s, or I guess at that point in my late 30s, I wasn't in a position to just like flat out retire. Because even the way that my wife and I ended up here in northern Vermont was a series of progressive steps. Because we went from having those conversations in the fall of 2015 and saying, hey, maybe we do end up finding a place and trying to have a piece of land, that by the summer of 2016, I guess it was mid-July to be exact, we actually closed on the purchase of this farm here, Goldshaw Farm in Peachum, Vermont. In 2017, I guess the fall of 2017, late summer 2017, my wife Allison actually left Washington, D.C., And she moved up here to Vermont, even though I was still living back in D.C. You see, because when we bought the place in 2016, the idea was, hey, we're going to have this farm in Vermont. It's going to be closer to our family. It's going to be a place that we go for like vacations and we work on fixing it up. And then maybe like when we're older, like in our 50s or our 60s, we retire up to the farm and that's where we actually start farming. And that was like the initial plan when we bought it. But it didn't take too long, probably by, I don't know, January of 2017. And, and just let me tell you, living in Washington, D.C. in January of 2017, kind of with an administration change and a lot of the chaos that was going on, just left us really feeling like, hey, maybe this isn't the place for us. I was unhappy in my job. My wife was unhappy in her job. And so we made the decision for us to start to find a way to move up here to Vermont sooner. Allison, who originally was an RN, like when we started dating, she was working as an RN in an emergency room in a children's hospital in in Hartford, Connecticut. She actually went and got her master's in public health while we were engaged. And when we got married in New York, she was actually working in public health. When we moved to D.C., she was working in public health. But she was actually finding that public health was a grind and she wasn't actually liking her job and she wanted to go back to practicing medicine. And given that there's just a rural health crisis, which could be a whole podcast topic unto itself at some point, she decided that she wanted to become a nurse practitioner and do medicine in, you know, a more or less rural environment. And the program that she went into was actually an interesting one. Like she went through Georgetown and their school of nursing, and that's like the school she attended. Most of her classes were virtual But then like, I don't know, a couple times a semester, she'd have to like go to Georgetown for a week or two for like intensive practice. But a lot of her practical training required her to be at a clinic. And she figured, hey, if I'm going to be in a clinic and I want to work in Vermont, I might as well go work at clinics in Vermont. And so the fall of 2017, she was actually living up here and starting school. I was still in Washington, D.C., working my job, working on actually selling our row house, obsessively looking for work that could bring me up to New England, whether it be in Boston or even more far-fetched, like somewhere here in Vermont. 
And, and although it took a while, by May of 2018, I had quit my job in Washington, D.C., I had sold our house, and I had found a job working at a life insurance company here in Vermont. And that is how Goldshaw Farm started back in the spring of 2018. And it's kind of cool. Like, if you go back even on our YouTube channel, you can see this where they're like, was this shift where... I knew that I was going to start to move up here eventually, but I couldn't like talk about it. And like until the day that I actually quit my job, then I eventually put out a video talking about it because my plan had been, I wanted to start raising ducks first and foremost. And I was going to make YouTube videos to tell people about my duck eggs and how good they were and show them the process of raising these ducks. And that would be how I market my duck eggs. And so that's actually even how like videos got started initially posted on our YouTube channel. And if you like really want to go back and, and like fact check me on this one, you, you can go back to, you know, our YouTube channel and look at some of the earliest videos. That's pretty much how it started. Like I, I set the YouTube channel up as a way to just like share video clips with family and friends at first. But then, yeah, the spring of 2018, I was like, no, nope, I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to start making videos about the farm so that I can sell all these duck eggs. And I will admit that when I started to make that transition and I was able to move up here and I was able to live on the farm and be back to living with my wife on a daily basis, which was also a whole other episode and story to talk about of, of living apart like that. But I was definitely feeling really good in that spring of 2018. But it didn't take long for me to start to slip back a little bit into my usual sense of melancholy and depression that I had been experiencing in Washington, D.C. Because, because my mindset kept slipping back to, oh gosh, I really love doing this farming thing and I'm glad that I'm up and at the farm now. But gosh, I got this day job and this day job has, you know, an hour commute one way each morning and an hour commute back each evening. And so I'm wasting so much time just driving around in the truck. I'm stuck in these meetings doing work that I'm just not all that interested or passionate about. And all I really want to do is be out working on my farm, trying to figure out ways to make it better, trying to figure out ways to make the business successful, trying to make videos about it because I was getting really into the storytelling aspect of it as well. I was, I was finding that that combination of the physical farm work as well as the creative expression of making videos was like the exact type of work that was scratching my vocational itch. I don't know if you guys heard that, but Toby Dog just barked at something. You know, things are starting to wake up, so... He might start barking more, just fair warning. But I digress because I was starting to still be sad and I was starting to still say, hey, something's not right and I need to keep making life changes. And, and I will definitely look back at that period of time and say there were like a lot of ups and downs. And the ups were good because I would have these moments on the farm or these days or weeks on the farm where I was just incredibly happy and things just seemed like they were going great. But then I would sink into depression and I would do just these awful self-destructive things. You know, I've talked in, in past YouTube videos about how for years, pretty much, I don't know, since childhood, teenage years, I guess I should say, I've, I've struggled with an eating disorder and, and really binge eating specifically. And I would often do that where I would have these cycles where I'd be really happy and things would be great and I'd be living a very healthy lifestyle. And then I'd have on weeks on end, I would slip into a depression and, and it really was something that, that made me struggle. I mean, look at this photo of me. Uh, I apologize to folks who are on the audio version of this podcast, but if you're on the video version on YouTube, you can see this photo of me and you can look into my eyes and look closely. Those are the eyes of a person who is dead on the inside. Like I, I look back at that photo and I just see myself and I can just see that I'm trying to pretend like I'm feeling good and I'm feeling happy, but I wasn't. And I was both uncomfortable with how I, I was living, but I was also just uncomfortable with myself. And, and so that was just a struggle. And I was also having this crisis of faith at that time because I was like, oh gosh, here I am. I've got this farm. I'm so, this is what I've been working for. This is what I've been pining over for the last three or four years. And now here I am, I'm doing it. I'm on the farm. I'm farming. I'm, I'm making it work. And I was still really, really unhappy. And I was starting to say, well, gosh, what the heck's going to do it? What is going to make me happy? Because 
this is this is just not good. This is not how you should should live your life. But I took those feelings and I crammed them down and I just kind of ignored it and I just kept going through it. And I'm somebody who has always been driven by my passion and I'm, you know, always a workaholic. I can obsessively get hooked into a goal and just dig in and work as hard as I possibly can to achieve that goal. And that's, that's definitely one of my strengths, but it's also one of my critical flaws because in that time period after I moved up to the farm and, you know, I was working a day job, I was running a farm and I was making content about the farm. It was like I had three jobs stacked all on top of each other at once and so rather deal with the, the emotions I was feeling, I just kind of pushed them aside and focused in on the work. And I think that that mode of operation was damaging to relationships with family. I think that mode of operation was damaging to relationships with friends. I think it was damaging to even my, my marriage with Allison. Like, I don't think it was good because I was using either like food in a binge eating setting to mask some of the pain that I was feeling. And I was also using work and focusing on a goal to, to distract myself as well. And I was doing that over and over and over and over again. And, you know, in some ways, like it was going okay because like things were going well with the farm. Like, like, I mean, honestly, you know, the farm itself was growing. I was learning new skills I was figuring out how to actually be a farmer. And at the same time, I was, you know, growing an audience like on YouTube and other platforms, uh, TikTok especially. And, and so like things were growing and things were going well from external metrics. But again, if I look on the inside and look how I was feeling, it wasn't going as good as I might have liked to pretend that it was. And on those moments when I took some quiet introspection and really thought about what I was doing and how I was feeling, I was really struggling because if I was being honest with myself, I was saying, gosh, you know, you thought this whole farm thing was going to be the thing that makes you happy. And here you are just as miserable as ever. What the heck is wrong with you? How are things ever going to change? But I continued to make progress and things grew so much that by January of 2022, I guess, well, technically it was, it was the fall of 2021, I was able to quit my job. You know, I put in my notice, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I guess it was like, I don't know, September or October of, of 2021 and said, hey, look, guys, by the end of the year, you know, I'm done with this job. And so uh, I think it was like the first week of January was my last week of work at the insurance job. I quit. And then starting in, in January 2022, I was able to just be full time on the farm and, and had this great combination of working on the farm, taking care of the animals, writing a book at that time and actually finishing writing a book at that time, as well as just making videos and doing this stuff. And, and, you know, at that point I had like another little upswing because I was like, oh gosh, I'm doing it. Here I am. I'm happy. Things are great. This is awesome. Like this is what I've worked so hard for. And, and there I was yet again, feeling sad, feeling depressed, doing self-destructive things like wolfing down entire pizzas all by myself. And it really got me saying, well, golly, what am I going to do here? How are things going to ever get better? How are things going to change? What's going to change inside me? What's going to happen if this doesn't make me happy? If essentially working my dream job situation of having a farm and working on a farm as well as making content about that farm isn't going to make me happy. I don't think anything ever will. And I think it was that point when I kind of had this realization of uh, kind of a combination of two important 20th century philosophers. I guess first with Marx, um, Richard Marx, that is. Wherever you go, whatever you do. Like that idea. If I combine that with another really important philosopher, probably one of the more important ones to me personally, of Frank Zappa, who said, you are what you is. When I look at those two competing philosophies, 
I really do come to this realization that wherever you go, whatever you do, you are what you is. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you are what you is. And until you take steps to try to deal with that and get at the root of who you are, you're never, ever, 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 ever going to truly find that happiness. And, and so I realized at that point, yeah, like I said, it was, it was probably, so yeah, I quit working in January. I was trying to have the, the live my best life over those first couple of months, but I don't know, I guess it was, it was by the spring of 2022, I was realizing, look, I need to do something. I probably need to get some help. And, and so that's actually when I started to seek treatment for my binge eating disorder. From a from a weight perspective, I was I was definitely getting to be at my heaviest, darn close to three hundred pounds, and I was just so unhappy, and my health habits were unhappy, and you know, given that I was now a guy in my mid forties, I was starting to worry about like impacting my longevity, and and so yeah, I, I started to seek help, and and that's you know the main thing I did for for that help was actually just starting to work really in a focused and intentional manner with a therapist and in doing that it helped me start to kind of uncover some issues and problems that I was having around just my emotions how I grew up certain behaviors that were seen as comforts at the time and like I was almost conditioned as a kid to see as comforts that I was now continuing to rely on anytime I got stressed or I got unhappy and it was looking at those things and dealing with those things that truly got me to get at some of the root of my, my eating disorder issues. And it's not to say that like it's cured and, and I've completely solved it because I haven't. I still struggle with it on a regular basis. It's something that has been hard. I mean, like, you know, like give you an example. A few weeks ago, you know, I had another little, I'll call it depressive episode when it comes to uh, the disappearance of Molly Murder Mittens. And, you know, it's still something that makes me very, very sad, but there was a good week or two where I couldn't even think about her without just breaking down into tears. And when I was going through that, and just even, like, talking to my therapist about how I was feeling when I was going through that, I started to recognize that, like, hey, this is, like, one of the first times in my life where I'm so in touch with how I'm feeling about something, and I'm not just you know, going for a behavior to, to mask that feeling, I'm actually dealing with it and addressing it and, and talking to folks about it. And, you know, I was talking to my therapist about it. I was talking to Allison about it. I was, heck, I even made a couple of videos and podcasts talking about it. And that process kept me from doing a lot more self-destructive things that I could have been doing. And, and so I think it was in that of like looking at how I deal with things that became way, way more important than looking at just my setting or my situation and making the things that I was doing fall into place. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you are what you is. And and for those of you guys who kind of got hooked into this and were saying, hey, no, no, I really want to understand why a farm's not going to make me happy – it really comes down to that because I know folks right now have these goals and, and, you know, are dreaming of purchasing a piece of land or dreaming about having a flock of chickens or ducks one day or dreaming about quitting their day job and, and leaving the rat race behind and, and doing some sort of work that they find more personally fulfilling. And I will say 100% that all of those things will help. I would be a bold-faced liar if I were to sit here in this greenhouse and say to you guys, oh, no, no, it doesn't matter. You know, if you work a job that you hate or if you live in a city that you hate or if you're unhappy with your environment or if you feel like your life has no purpose, trying to address those things will not impact your happiness or mental well-being whatsoever. That's, that's not true and that's not what I am saying. And, and please don't take that message away from this. Like you might be looking at those goals and looking at those things that you're dreaming of and saying that once you achieve that thing, it's going to be the answer. But I'm here to tell you that one lesson that I have learned over and over in life is that that's never going to be the case. 
you know, I remember when I was a teenager and, you know, living in suburban Connecticut, feeling like I was misunderstood and thought, gosh, if I move to a city and go to art school, that's when I'm going to fit in and that's when I'm going to find my people and that's when I'm going to be happy. And, and while I definitely found my people and I definitely found moments of happiness, the underlying sadness, the underlying problems I still had, they were still there. Or when I was in my 20s and, and started to get really focused on my career and dreaming about working my way up the corporate ladder and making more money and having more responsibility and maybe one day being a chief marketing officer. Like when I looked at that as my goal, that was a, another aspiration that was out there. But at the end of the day, that wasn't going to be the thing that made me happy. And by the time I was in my mid 30s and I'd achieved that goal, I was still pretty gosh darn happy arguably even more unhappy than I had been previously. And so that's why I say these things, because regardless of what you're pursuing and what dream you're chasing, achieving that dream is not going to be the thing that makes you happy. Finding comfort with who you are and finding your place, that's going to be the thing that makes you happy. Getting in touch with your feelings and getting in touch with what you're feeling and when you're feeling it and why you're feeling it, that's going to be the stuff that makes you happy. Creating connections and community and loved ones and and having other people in your life that make a difference, those are going to be the things that make you happy. And it's never just that one thing. I actually think much like I talk about a farm being an ecosystem, Your happiness is so much of an ecosystem of having a number of pieces in play. And in fact, if you wanted my personal recipe for happiness, I think it comes down to a few key things. I think number one, it's having other humans that you're connecting with, whether it's your spouse or partner or or some sort of situation like that, or other family members or friends or a local community, or a virtual community, or a patchwork of all of those things, which is, I think, what most of us have, having those other people and having those connections, I think, is important. I think having a purpose and a mission and and having something that you're building towards and having a goal, I actually do think if you don't have that, you will be unhappy. I think, like, if I look at uh, Bill Murray in Groundhog's Day, right? You know, there's so much philosophy that could be milked from that movie. And I know so many people have written like thought pieces over the years about it. But one of those things that I always identify with most in that movie is just how depressed Bill Murray gets when he realizes there's like no point to it all. Did you sleep well, Mr. Connors? He can just keep killing himself over and over again and keep doing things over and over again. And it just doesn't matter. And when you find yourself in that sort of a scenario, you can feel hopeless. But if you have that purpose, that can make a difference. I think having other things and other creatures that you're taking care of and responsible for matters too. Whether you're providing for your family or raising your children or you have animals that depend on you. While I know some people are going to probably scoff at this one, I do think that there is an element of being a caretaker that will make you happier. Being in service to someone or something else will make you happier. It's it's part of the picture as well. And, and again, back to the title of this, yes, a farm will not make you happy, but being in a setting that you want to be in will make you happier. And it, it is a, it's, it's a, an ingredient in the happiness recipe. You know, I don't think I would be happy if I was living in a large apartment building with no outdoor space. And I basically had a, you know, you know, 600 square foot apartment. I mean, that's kind of what I was living in, in in certain times of my life. And while it worked for me then, it definitely doesn't work for me now. And I'd be very unhappy there, but, but just simply moving wouldn't be the solution. It's just, like I said, it's an ingredient. Like you can't make a loaf of bread without yeast but yeast is not a loaf of bread. Then the other thing that I think for me was the part that I was missing most and and personally had to take the most work to address is, is getting in touch with yourself and your feelings and how you're feeling about things and finding healthy ways to 
communicate about those emotions and process those emotions because we as humans all have those things. And the more comfortable you are with expressing them and with identifying them and with addressing them, I think the, the, the less self-destructive you end up being. And, and so I know that, you know, particularly for like, say, middle-aged men, that's not a popular point of view. I, I actually think it's arguably one of the more important things for people to be working on and thinking about. And, you know, I've talked about this a bit in, in other forums, but I really do encourage folks, if they are struggling, you know, look into some sort of options like that. And on a related note, I think this is important to address as well. Um, sometimes for folks too, it's a brain chemistry thing. And, and I don't think that there's any shame in that. I don't, I don't think that that's been my, my situation personally, but I think there also is a stigma when it comes to mental health and thinking about, you know, potential chemical imbalances and using medications to correct those imbalances. Like that's something to, to consider as well. And maybe that's, that's your situation. And, and so again, working with a professional there that can really help you figure that one out and what you might need to do around that stuff. Um, you know, again, I haven't had to do that in terms of addressing my depression, but you know, another thing that I deal with is, and I've talked about this before too, is I've got ADHD, right? And I have found a number of things and I've tried a number of things over the years with how to like handle my ADHD and make it a less destructive force in my life. And, and one of the things that I did for a while, then stopped doing for a while and have been doing now for a little bit, I mean, a couple of years is a little bit, um, has been actually taking medication for my ADHD. And it, it actually just makes it easier for me to manage in that regard too. And, and, and so, yeah, like, I don't think it's necessarily something everybody has to do, but for some folks, it's actually really, really helpful and, and also worth looking at. So I think if you can get into that patchwork of stuff and you're wanting to live on a farm, then yeah, sure, a farm can make you happy. But the last point I want to leave you guys on related to this is, is around the idea of the farm itself and working on the farm. Because another thing that you're going to experience when you're on a farm is you're going to constantly be saying, oh, if I just do this, it's much like other things in life. If I just move to a farm, I'm going to be happy. Oh, if I just get these cattle, I'm going to be happy. Or, oh, if I just build this greenhouse, I'm going to be happy and things are going to be better on the farm. Just know that the biggest part about farming isn't the destination and the thing that you're chasing. It's in fact the journey. You know, on a previous episode, I was talking to my friend Jason from Sow the Land, and he was talking about, you know, kind of retirement life on the farm and homestead. And, and you know, there was a comment that he made, which I, like has stuck with me. And, and I, I wish I pushed back on him harder while we were talking about it, where he said, oh, I just, you know, I'll hopefully get all my infrastructure built by then. And, and I actually don't think that that's going to be the case. I think when I look at my farm, you know, 30, 40, 60 years from now, hopefully I'm still here 60 years from now. Like my, my goal, like legit is I want to be 104 years old. And when I'm 104 years old, I will walk out to those backwoods and hopefully get eaten by a bear. Like that is my goal in life. Um, because I feel like if I am in a situation where all of those stars align, where I'm able to live to be 104 years old and I'm still in the type of shape that I can walk up to my back pasture and into the woods and I'm still living on this land, I have done something very right in my life and, and it's a sign of a life well lived. And so that is my goal. But even then, I'm sure I'll be 95 and still having projects. Oh, I just need my mechanized robot suit to go clear out this next level of pasture so that I can add more fencing in. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's what things look like. Maybe they don't. But the idea is, I think, on farm and in farm life, it is so much about the journey not the destination. And so if you think you're wanting to live on the farm and you're thinking you're wanting a farm, really examine the why. If it's just because you envision those great days where it's like, oh, I went out this morning on a beautiful sunshiny summer morning and collected some eggs from the chickens and fed some grain to the pigs and was able to watch the cattle eat grass. And like, that's your vision of farm life. Believe me, I have those types of days. I will probably have that type of day this morning as the sun now comes up and I'm about to start doing my chores. But just also know you're going to have crappy days that come with it too. And so if you're not enjoying the journey and you're not enjoying the actual work, maybe it's not for you. 
So yes, that is just a, a thought that I had that I wanted to share with you guys this morning. I got to now actually get going and really start the farm day here. Since it's getting darker later right now, I just decided to take this as an opportunity to record this podcast. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this podcast episode. You know, if you want to really support this podcast, there, there are two things you can do. Number one, please be sure to check out my new book, Toby Dog of Goldshaw Farm. There's a link for it in the show description. Um, you know, purchase a copy, give a copy to a loved one. Anything you can do to spread the word would be super, super helpful there. And then number two if you have a chance, please, wherever you're listening to this podcast, write a review, whether it's on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google or wherever, you know, the more reviews that we have that actually helps us find more folks with this message and, and kind of, uh, you know, my goal really is I want to help folks when they're thinking about some of the things that I've been dealing with over the last few years. And so hopefully this podcast will find the folks who need it. And yeah, we can kind of all together make this world a better place. And so with that, I do have to get going, but I will be back again with another episode real soon. Thanks for listening, everybody. It's huh? got a soul, this hero falls. Release the cluckers! Falls asleep, deep inside my arms. We walk the fields <laughs> under the stars. For love is here, here in Gold Chalk Farms.